Okay, salam alaikum. Bismillah. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Welcome home everybody. Assalamu alaikum. It's good to see everybody back, alhamdulillah. Um, we are making good progress, alhamdulillah, with our, our text, our translation, and our commentary of the uh, book known as Fawa'id al-Balwa wal Mahan, The Virtues or the Benefits of Trials and Tribulations. And so we talk about trying to find meaning in trials, and this is something of a, an eternal challenge for humanity. Uh, religion has always been tasked, no matter what religion, it has always been tasked with the responsibility of trying to figure out why bad things happen and trying to make sense of the challenges that people have. And so we thought that it would be a good book to read. And alhamdulillah, we are uh, making way. We might be done with it next week, inshallah. So we might have a new series uh, by the middle of February, bi'idnillah. But we were talking about last week one of the benefits of trials in specific when a person goes through tests and tribulation is, as the author says very beautifully, that a person does not come to know or understand something until it is gone. That he says, لا يعرف مقدارها إلا بعد that the, the the reality of blessings is that a person tends to not realize what blessing they had until that blessing is absent. And so we talked about last week the phrase the, the phrase we say in English, you don't know what you got till it's gone. And this is really, really the case. This is true. And we see this time and time again. And so we read some hadith last week, but we weren't able to finish. So I want to finish. We just have one or two more about the importance of making sure that trials don't just come and go and that we remain the same after the trial leaves us. So this goal or this virtue, it's accepting that the trial is going to happen. And once a person accepts that the trial is going to happen, then the person goes through the trial they endure the difficulty, they have that patience, they have those realizations that we've talked about, right? This is the 16th uh, virtue, so we've gone through a lot. And then once the person goes through and finishes that trial or tribulation, afterwards, the question needs to be asked, like what type of person have they become? And the goal ultimately is that a person becomes more grateful after their equilibrium is established, after they are restored back to whatever it is they wanted to be put back at. When Allah Ta'ala restores a person's life or gives them comfort or gives them the strength to endure, then the person hopefully becomes grateful. And what happens when a person becomes grateful? They remember Allah constantly. And we talked about the ayah in which Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says that verily in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and in the exchange of the night and the day are signs for those who are people of intellect. And then Allah Ta'ala actually continues and He says they are those people who remember Allah in every scenario, whether they are standing, whether they are sitting, they're constantly remembering Allah. If anyone in here has ever been sick before to the point where you couldn't get up or you've been injured before to the point where you couldn't walk, or you've had a migraine or a headache to the point where you couldn't open your eyes. When Allah gives you that recovery and that shifa that you pray for, what is your first thought? What is the first conscious thought that a person has when they're able, when they're restored to do what it was that they were not able to do just a day ago, a day before? Their thought should be what? Alhamdulillah. Re being grateful to Allah. And the power of this is that that gratitude would not be present unless the person had that removed from them. So in the midst of removal, or in the process of removal, there's questioning, there's frustration, there's a being upset, resentment, chaos. But once the blessing is restored, or once a person has reached a state of homeostasis, like emotionally, then the person says, Alhamdulillah, food never tasted so good. 
than after your tongue recovers from being burned because you couldn't hold back from the Nihari, right? Food never tasted so good. Water never tasted so good than after a long day of fasting. When a person is able to get up and move around after being sick for a while, they have all the aspirations and they want to accomplish everything because they're grateful that Allah gave them another chance. And ultimately, this you know, other chance, this second chance that we refer to, the greatest second chance that a person will seek from Allah is after they die. And this is why these trials, as difficult as they are, they are really just the framing for the largest trial, which is the Day of Judgment. All of these small trials that we go through, right? Flight delays, illnesses, congestion, cold. How many of you are sick right now? Ah, good. You didn't raise your hand, right? Because the person next to you is going to slide over a little bit, <laughs> pull that mask out of their pocket. It's been a long time, right? <laughs> Dust it off, put it on. When you're sick, you, it's difficult, but you know that there's going to be some recovery. You know that you're going to get, inshallah, a second chance. But on the Day of Judgment, when a person asks Allah, Oh Allah, send me back. Send me back. Give me another chance. I'll just make one sajda. That's all I'll do. Allah Ta'ala, as Imam al-Ghazali you know, summarizes beautifully, Allah Ta'ala will respond to them and say, Where did you just come from? You're asking to go back to a place you just came from. What guarantee, what promise do you have that you're going to go back and live the life that you should have? So all of these tests and trials, as much as we are in them, they also are a preparation for the greatest test that we're in. And Imam Ghazali and others, they say, the way you respond to the test and trial is the way that you will respond on the Day of Judgment. If you're able to respond with faith and trust and sincerity with Allah in this life, then on the Day of Judgment, inshallah, by Allah's grace, you won't have anything to worry about. But if a person, every time they get tested, it destroys them and derails them and completely puts them off, then the Day of Judgment, which is the greatest test, will be a very, very, very difficult day, particularly for that person. May Allah protect us. And may Allah make the Day of Judgment easy for us. Right? There are some people that on the Day of Judgment, it will go by for them all of the... The, 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 the trials of the hour will go by for them much quicker and much easier than others. And the difference between those two people is not something on that day, but it's the life they lived before that day. And so let's read some of these narrations, inshallah, and then I'll give you some things to, to, to think about, as we, or all of us to think about, really, as we move forward. One of the things that he mentions in this text is he references the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says that obviously we know that fasting is something that is rewarded. Yes, Ramadan is coming. May Allah Ta'ala give us Ramadan, allow us to reach it. Ramadan is something that is a, a plethora, an abundance of reward. And we know that fasting is one of the most beloved deeds to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But the Prophet ﷺ says, الشاكر, that the one who eats, the one who eats and they are grateful for what they've eaten. الشاكر, the one who eats and is grateful for what they have eaten, he says, مثل أجري الصائم الصابري, is just like the person that did not eat, that fasted, but they handled it patiently. So let's talk about what it means to be patient while fasting. Are you guys ready? As mashallah, people are drinking their coffee and pounding their cookies, mashallah. Okay? Fasting. Fasting is very interesting because Imam Ghazali writes about this in his book in the Secrets of, the, of, of, of Fasting, Kitab as al Siyam. He says that not everyone maybe fasts, but not everyone gets the same reward for fasting. It's the same as prayer. Everybody in the line prays, but not everyone is actually yielding the same reward in the prayer. So what is it that makes the reward different for the different people? It's the quality of what they've done. If I'm sitting there praying and I'm thinking about things that have nothing to do with Allah, then of course, the person who's actually praying and thinking about Allah, they're going to be, number one, they're going to be rewarded in a better way. But number two, they're going to actually harvest more sweetness from the salah. It's the same with fasting, right? You don't have to raise your hand, but I'm going to ask some 
general questions. I'm going to put these out there, okay? How many of us, on the days that we don't have responsibilities or work, or for those of us who work from home, air quotes, work from home, okay? How many of us try to time a nap where we perfectly wake up just in time for iftar? Don't raise your hand, okay? How many of us, now here's the interesting thing, how many of us, we eat a suhoor that is so, uh, what's the word, that is so abundant and so luxurious, the goal of which is to not feel hunger, that that suhoor actually keeps us so full until almost the time for iftar. I remember one time I was doing itikaf in a masjid in an unknown city, I can't share with you the name. It was Chicago. So I was in Chicago. <laughs> and it was my hometown. And so I was doing itikaf there. And I remember we were eating suhoor. And I'm used to eating like light things. And I'm in itikaf with, mashallah, the, you know, the Pakistani and, and, and the Indian uncles. And they are, mashallah, throwing down. <laughs> and they all had, they had this phenomenal system where, you know, itikaf, you can't leave the masjid. You, you have to stay within the boundaries of the masjid because your goal is to be there and worship. But they had like, they had like the aunties were on lock and then they had like the young kids who would come in with the masjid with the trays of food and they would lay it out. And I'm talking like four in the morning and it looks like a spread at a wedding, at a walima. And I remember asking like, it, you know, is there like some fruit? Is there like something that we can just eat that's not going to, you know, destroy me at lower time? And the uncle said, and this is again, this is a strategy. It's a strategy, right? He said, no, beta, we have to eat and so that we are full all day and we only feel hungry right when Asr is ending. That's, that's the goal. That's the goal, right? Now, we might laugh, but like how many of us take like those slow-release caffeine pills? Right, which I've seen people like, you know, sell at Tarawih, like the black market <laughs> behind the dumpster in the Mesha parking lot. <laughs> you know why this is an interesting idea? Because these hacks, you know, eating a, 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 an ungodly amount of food at a very godly time. So who is the most godly time, right? It's the Hajjid time, right? Eating a f an amount of food that is, that is problematic, Trying to hack the system. And I'm not making inkar. I'm not saying it's haram. That's not, I'm not a mufti. I'm don't, I don't do, but I want you to think about it. Is it possible for a person to really feel the effects of siyam, of fasting, and being patient with it if all they've done is try to strategize how they can make it feel the easiest as possible? Like, is it possible? Is it possible that whenever a person feels any like discomfort, they just instantly find a mattress and lay down. And then you, and then you hear stories. You know, Hakim Olajuwon, may Allah bless him. For me, I'm 35, turning 36. He was a legend. Why? Because he played in the playoffs and eventually in the finals while fasting in Ramadan. They had daytime games, 3 p.m., 12 p.m. And you know what was crazy? He, for some of those games, they were away games. He was traveling. He could have broken his fast. Within the Islamic rules, it would have been completely fine. No problem. No one would have even batted an eye. But subhanAllah, he didn't. And then after, he actually said that when I'm fasting, I play better. I play better. Now you might say like, oh, how? You're dehydrated, electrolytes, da-da-da-da-da. Allah knows best, man. But do we believe in a thing called barakah, blessings? Do we believe that Allah can place in someone's life a substance that makes your life better, that is not materially or mathematical detectable? Yes. So this is why when the Prophet ﷺ is talking about the virtue of a person who is fasting, what he's teaching us is that if you're able to bear patiently in life, you will find barakah in those moments that you would not find in moments of ease. In moments of ease. And the other side of this hadith that's amazing is that when you are in a moment of ease, it's very difficult to be grateful. It's tough to be as grateful as you should be for moments of ease if Allah does not put you in a moment of difficulty. You never experience it. That's why at thought we're very grateful for food. So moving forward, right, inshallah, 
especially Ramadan being a month and a half away, I want us all to think about not how we can make the trials easier, but how we can bear with them better. It's not necessarily about reducing the waves. It's about strengthening your ship and being able to have the waves crash upon you. And this is what the Prophet وسلم, he teaches us. Now, there's another hadith, and this is, you know, a very, very, uh, there's, this hadith is quoted by Fox News. So I wanted to quote it and share it and talk about it and, and say what it, what it comes from. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, okay, how many of you are here in here are married? Okay, if, you're, if your wife is here, brothers, if your wife is here when I read this hadith, do not look at her. I'm just telling you, do not look. I have no appointments for marital counseling. When I read this hadith, first of all, you're misunderstanding it. Okay, we're going we're gonna to talk about it. But please, please do not look in the direction of your wife. I want you to look at me the entire time. Okay. It's hadith of the Prophet Wasallam as he's speaking to some companions and he's speaking to some women companions. And he says... إن الله لا ينظر إلى امرأة لا تشكر لزوجها وهي لا تستغني عنه. This hadith translates as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not, and this could mean now or in the akhirah, in the day of judgment, will not even pay any attention. And again, he's speaking at this point specifically to female companions. So he's giving them advice for them. It wouldn't make sense for him to talk about other people. He said that Allah will not look at the woman who is married and to her spouse she's ungrateful and the spouse is the one who provides for her and she would not be able to take care of herself otherwise husbands don't look look at me focus okay okay this hadith is quoted left and right to show how misogynistic the prophet sallallahu was would aidu billah of course not it's quoted left and right to show that Islam is not a religion that can handle modernity and handle equality. Of course not. This hadith actually, the most operative part of it is the last part. Where he says, وَلَا تَسْتَغْنِ anhu," And she would not be capable of providing for herself if it were not for him. Not talking about every woman, talking about this specific relationship. So then, when you look in the commentary of this hadith, you find the scholars say that yes, there are some scenarios where in this specific matter, there might be a husband and a wife, and the wife is not grateful, and the husband is taking care of her, and that's a problem. But there's also scenarios, and I'll give you other ones, where a husband and wife, and the wife is taking care of something, and the husband is not grateful, and that's also a problem. There's also a scenario where parents take care of their kids, and do everything for their kids, and kids are not grateful, and that's also a problem. There are scenarios where people are helpless and are being supported. They are dependents. And in their dependency, in their moment of relying on somebody else, they are not grateful. They're ungrateful to the one that is taking care of them, and as a result of that, Allah will not give them attention on the Day of Judgment when everyone needs Allah's attention the most. May Allah protect us. What, why would I share this hadith in a class talking about finding meaning in trials? So not a lot of you raised your hands when I said who's married. So alhamdulillah, I've been married almost 16 years. Let me give you guys a little, say mashallah. Jeez, man. Walk straight into another room. Say mashallah. Allahumma barak lana, ya rab. That's why before you talk about how long you've been married, you got to say, I made dua that Allah gives everyone the most beautiful, handsome, rich, religious spouse, right? And then you say, I've been married this long. And everyone's like, okay, yeah, cool. We're cool with you. <laughs> when you get married, okay, marriage is, as the Prophet Sallallahu described it, having a righteous spouse is one of the best things, if not the best thing that a person can have in their life, if it is good for them, if it increases them in their relationship towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu says, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي 
that nikah, marriage, is part of my, that's, that's how I live. That's my life. And whoever decides that nikah is not part of their life because they think that they got it figured out some other way, he said, they're not from me. They can't claim me then. I'm not, I don't know them. <laughs> okay? So marriage is something that the Prophet ﷺ speaks about. Of course, the Qur'an revealed the idea of marriage. The function of marriage is to give a person sakina and tranquility. And that is what Allah designed marriage to do. But there are moments when people in the marriage are out of whack where things can go bad. Yes or no? Not too emphatically married people. Right? Don't be too... Yes, it's possible. Fights can happen. Arguments can occur. Right? Yes or no? Okay. If you don't know, then I'm telling you, yes, it's possible. Okay? So in that moment, that is a test. That is a trial in your marriage. It is. And for 99, right, or 98% of trials in, in marriage that are not dysfunctional, that are not abusive, I'm, I'm, not, I'm leaving all those in a special category. That's a different conversation. I'm talking about, hey, you left the cabinets open again. Hey, you did this again. Hey, you parked in my spot again. Da, 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 da. These fights, these arguments. And they can cascade and they can snowball into greater ones. They tend to consume the heart of a person. And both sides start to say what? It's my, it's my right. I'm not being respected. I'm not being loved. I'm not being this, 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 this. Do you know what instantly resolves almost all of the marriage conflicts that come across my desk? When somebody who is having arguments and disagreements with their spouse then comes to me and says, I just found out that my friend's husband has cancer. I just found out that my friend's wife has this, has this disease, this diagnosis, or my friend's husband just died, or my friend's wife, it's not looking good for her. Then all of a sudden, the very same person that you were complaining about, or that we were complaining about, we go to that person with tears in our eyes and we say, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I don't want to argue anymore. I'm, I'm done arguing about these petty fights, these arguments that really don't even matter. It's just a battle of egos. I'm done. Translate it. I know everyone's a little bit kind of sensitive because it's marriage. Let's talk about something else. Translate it to your parents. We all grew up with fights and disagreements with parents. Then you start to see your parents getting old. You're like, is it really worth it? Is it worth like trying to one up and win the argument with them in their old age? And you're wondering like, you know, I saw this video. They said you don't have 20 years left with your parents. If you see them once a year, twice a year, you only have 20 times left with them. Right? So you don't think about that. And then the minute that your mom or dad is old and they start to cough or they start to feel a little bit weak in their chest, then you start thinking like, okay, you start to think differently about how you behave with them. Because you realize that you would not be here had it not been for them. Right? So all of the disagree, all of the, the fitan that you thought you had, when Allah shows you a moment of removal of that thing, you say, you know, it's not worth it. I'm so good. I'm so happy. I will take all of it back just to have one more moment. All of the fights and disagreements, just to have one more conversation, one more meal, one more hug, one more. Ask somebody if they're okay with it, who's lost somebody, what they would give to have one more day with the person they loved. And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu said this. He's not saying this to say that, wives, be more grateful to your husbands. He's saying, look, it is so normal and natural to complain about people. How many of you in this room right now are cold? Too cold. How many of you are too hot? Okay, there's a few raising their hands. It's easy to complain. We have complainers here. <laughs> all right, about the temperature. People, we all, and you know what? I'm cold. I'm with you, by the way. My feet are freezing. I'm with you. I should have worn socks. But it's easy to complain. But then the moment the thing that you complain about is removed, you're like, it was so nice while we had it. So that's why he's saying what? He's saying, if you have a relationship, if you're married, if you're a child, if you're a parent, if you're a parent, if you have kids, 
Complaining about kids, subhanAllah. Complaining about your children. And, and I've seen and I've been in gatherings where people complain about their children in the presence of people who are struggling to have children. Completely unaware of the, the burn and the pain and the sharp stabbing you know, injury that that's causing the person. Ugh, couldn't sleep again last night. And that person is silently crying saying, I would give anything to have a child who wouldn't sleep. This, this, this era, this gener- generation of complaining, Wallahi, Ibn Ata'illah, he said that if you complain, Allah will drag you back to him in gratitude by removing the thing you were complaining about. So it's best that if we have good in our life, we say Alhamdulillah. And if we have trials in our life, we don't ignore the trial, but we surround ourselves by thinking about all of the good that surrounds that trial. And we realize that we are so overwhelmed with blessings that even if this one thing is kind of annoying, it's not that big of a deal. Wallahi, he's not that big of a deal. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us tawfiq. So I want everybody tonight to go home and to text or to call or to say to the person that you've been beefing with, hey, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. All right? And if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be here. Omar bin Abdul Aziz. And this goes back to Tawakkul. Omar bin Abdul Aziz. You know who Omar is? They actually call him the fifth righteous Khalifa. He was not from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he was a, uh, he was a Khalifa. That, he was a Khalifa that was extremely noble and pious. So his personality and his story is legendary. Umar bin Abdul Aziz, he used to make a dua. He used to say, Allahumma, O oh Allah, Raddini bi qada'ika. That, O oh Allah, make me content and happy and pleased with your, what you have decreed for me. وَبَارِكْلِي fi qadraka, O Allah, and bless me in whatever you have given me. Hatta, which in Arabic translates to, basically, so that I, or in a way that I can become what? لا أحب تعجيل شيء أخرته. Oh Allah, make my heart content with what you have destined for me in a way that my heart never yearns that you have to speed up things for me that you delayed for me. وَلَا تَأْخِيرْ شَيْءٍ عَجَلْتَهُ Or that you never have to delay things that you actually have decreed for me in that moment. You know this dua is so beautiful for? Because he's saying, Oh Allah, make me happy with you in a way where I'm not just happy with you, but I'm actually happy with your timing. Your timing is the perfect timing. All of us want certain things, and we believe that yes, one day Allah will give us that thing, that job, that spouse, that house, whatever. But it's not about the thing, it's really about accepting the timing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The resentment and the hurt and the rejection comes from timing. Why? Why now? Why me right now? Oh Allah, any other time but now. Umar bin Abdul Aziz said, no, make dua that Allah cleans your heart so that your heart is happy with whatever happens, whether you wanted it to be delayed, oh Allah, make my heart happy that it's here right now. Or if it's too soon in your eyes, oh Allah, make me happy that it's here. Give me the satisfaction that it's here. Now, the next point that he brings up is actually... uh, it's a long story, and we'll finish with this because we don't have too much time left. But we'll finish with this. And we have a special, alhamdulillah, uh, uh, moment to share with everybody at the end. Bi'idnillah. He mentions the next point, and he says that you understand that there are many hidden benefits in the trial. And he quotes an ayah that's very interesting. He quotes an ayah from Surah An-Nur. And the ayah says... 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الذين جاءوا بالإفك عصبة منكم Indeed those who came to you as a group of people who came with a slanderous lie It's interesting, okay لا تحسبوه شرا لكم Don't think that those people are bad for you This is an interesting statement Allah is telling the Prophet ﷺ and the companions, those people, and one companion in particular, her name is Aisha radiallahu anha, he's saying, those people that came together and formed this ifk. Ifk means a slanderous lie. Like not just like a small lie, not just like an exaggeration. A lie that can get someone canceled. I know that that's going to rattle people in the room. Like, oh, Right? It, it, it gets, it's a lie that was made up that can destroy somebody's life. He says, لا تحسبوه شر لكم بل هو خير لكم He says, actually, it's good for them. Or it's good for you. That lie that they made was good for you. What is the story? When you guys hear this story, I'm not going to say the whole thing in detail. But when you hear what the actual story is and what happened, and realize that this verse was revealed about that, it's going to blow your mind. Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrates. And she says that one time I was on a journey with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And on this journey, we were on an expedition coming back from an expedition. And I was being carried, I was being carried on, you know those uh, things that they would carry, like the, the structures that they place on top of camels? So I was being carried on one of those. She said, we took a break, we rested for the desert, and I went to go and use the bathroom. She went and used the bathroom, and then she came back. As she was coming back, she took her hand and she felt her chest, and when she felt her chest, she was missing a necklace. She goes, I was missing the necklace. She had a special necklace that was made of a stone that she adored, and she could not find it. So she went back to the area where she used the restroom. And when the Muslims got up to leave, they lifted up her, uh, her seat. And because she was so light, she says, I was so light that they did not realize that I was gone. And they went ahead and they left without me. So then she says that when I found my necklace, I came running back to the area where the army was. And no one was there. And there was no individual, there was no mark. I couldn't tell where they went. Now this is like a big, big musibah. Like being lost and not knowing. And, and again, a desert is not like, a, you know, there's no roads. If you're in the middle of the desert, everywhere looks the same. You're looking left, right, straight, back. You can't tell. In fact, if you turn too much, you might even confuse yourself. There's no landmarks. It's all just desert. So she says that I went and I sat down in the place where I was thinking that they would notice me and that they would come back and find me. While I was sitting there, I became tired. And so she said, I fell asleep. I laid down and fell asleep. There was a companion, his name is Safwan bin Mu'attal al-Sulami. And he, they used to leave one person that would trail the army just in case something happened like a messenger kind of like uh, uh, individual Safwan he sees a person he doesn't know who it is lying on the sand in the desert just lying there not moving so Aisha she's narrating and she says I woke up suddenly to a person saying inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un we're laughing because, again, we obviously know the future that she's fine. But he literally thinks he found the wife of the Prophet ﷺ deceased in the desert. And he's, he's standing there and he's in the So she says, I woke up when he recited the istirja, which is in the as soon as he recognized me. She said, I woke up, right, sudden. And she goes, you know, I kind of like fixed my, 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 my scarf. And my face uh, covered my face, and she said that as soon as he saw me, like basically move, he went to his his riding animal and he pulled the riding animal down. He didn't say a single word to her, and he just pulled the riding animal down and let her get on the animal. 
so that she didn't have to walk. He said that then he was leading the animal. He was pulling the animal ahead of her, and I was sitting on it. And he said, she said that in the middle of this journey, it became very hot. And so we required the animal and us, we required rest. So we sat and took some rest. Eventually, they got back to where they were in. Uh, they met up with the rest of the army. And they caught up. And they eventually came back to the city. Now, who is sitting outside on the outskirts of the city? There's a few people. Some of them are actually companions that are believers. But one of them, his name is Abdullah bin Ubay al-Salul, or Ibn, Ubay, uh, Ibn Salul, who is known as the leader of the hypocrites. I want you to imagine for a second what's happening. Abdullah bin Ubay, uh, Allah, Abdullah bin Ubay Ibn Salul, he's looking out and he sees the wife of the Prophet وسلم, returning back from a journey with another man. And he, because he's a hypocrite, says, interesting. And he starts to propagate and perpetuate a lie. Oh, interesting. Now, he's not dumb. He's not going to say, oh, I think that this happened. But he just starts to ask these tiny questions. That's weird. Why would she? Hmm. Why would he? Hmm. Just planting the seeds, just like shaitan. Just planting those seeds. And what happens is these companions who are Muslim, they hear this, and against their better judgment, they start to also wonder, what's going on? What's happening? Why is Umm Mu'minin Aisha radiallahu anha, why is she with that guy? And what's going on? Before she knows it, before Aisha knows it, the entire town, the entire place is buzzing with this rumor, this slander about her and the man who saved her life. To the point where Aisha radiallahu anha, when she returned back to Medina, she said, I became ill for an entire month. I couldn't get out of my bed. I was so, I want you to understand, this is the, of the purest of women, the wives of the Prophet sallallahu with this rumor being made up about her. And it's spreading and everyone's talking about it. And even if they don't believe it, it's still there and she feels it. She says, I was sick for an entire month. She said that people added on to the story, exaggerated. They forged statements. You know how stories go. And she said, and I was sitting there, and all I wanted to know was what the Prophet ﷺ was thinking. And she said, I noticed that he also was very stressed about the situation. Now, pause. You go to the perspective of the Prophet ﷺ, of course, in his heart, he obviously has faith in his wife Aisha. But he also, again, a lot of people when they read this hadith, like, why didn't the Prophet Sallallahu just stand up and say, everyone be quiet? Because he's the messenger of Allah. And if he shows any form of preemptive bias of protecting his family, then that may give these evil people a claim against his fairness. So what he does is he checks in with her. And he asks, how is she? But Aisha says, I know my husband. And I know that these rumors, this slander was bothering him. And he was waiting to receive revelation from Allah about this. So then she said, when I finally felt better, no one was talking to me normally. I was like a stranger in my own city. No one was speaking to me. No one was treating me normally. Except for my aunt, Umm Mustah. One day we went out together and my aunt tripped. This is actually a really funny part of the story. She was my aunt tripped. Umm Mustah, she tripped. And when she tripped, she fell down and she said she cursed her son, whose name was Mustah, who wasn't there. Like she just tripped and she said, may Mustah be ruined. <laughs> it's really funny. Especially if you have Arab parents, it's really funny. Because you're like, sure, it's my fault. So then Aisha, she says to her aunt, <laughs> why would you say that about him? He's not here. She pushes back. She's like, what a difficult thing. And then she says, subhanAllah, listen to Aisha. Would you say that about a man who took place in the battle of Badr? Who fought with angels? 
So she pushes back on her aunt. She says, why would you say that about a person who took part in the Battle of Badr? Um Mustah is a little bit embarrassed. And so she responds to her niece now, Aisha, and she says, wait till I tell you what he said about you. At this point, Aisha doesn't know the full extent of the rumors. She just knows that people are talking and it's kind of weird and everyone's kind of gossiping. Um Mustah is the one who tells her exactly what people are saying. That she was unfaithful, which of course we know is not true. She said that when I found this, she said, I started weeping and weeping and weeping. She goes, I just went home. And she literally said, I wept until I fell asleep and I woke up and I wept all day until I fell asleep. <laughs> you talk about a fitna. You talk about a person lying in bed saying, oh Allah, why? And then it gets even more, subhanAllah, so human. Listen to this. The Prophet ﷺ, he approaches some companions and he asks them. He says, what do you know about Aisha? Almost like, subhanAllah, like he, he, he's being reminded of her character. And the companions, they say, Usama bin Zaid, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I don't, none of us know anything but good from her. None of us know anything but good from her. Barira, another companion, the Prophet ﷺ asked, did you ever see anything in my wife's character that caused you any concern? And Barira responded, by Allah, I have never seen anything in her that I would ever conceal. The only thing I know about her is that she gives food in secret to those who are miskeen without anybody knowing. They're all testifying for her character. The Prophet ﷺ, he gets upset with Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul and he actually gets up on the member and he mentions that whoever is a part of this rumor with Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he says it needs to be taken care of. And so the companions start to get up and they grab their swords and they're like, we'll take care of business. And they start to actually argue with each other because they had some tribal beef as well. The Prophet ﷺ, he quieted everybody and he realized that this was going to get out of hand so he made everyone stay quiet. Aisha says, all that day I kept weeping and my tears never stopped. She said, I cried so hard I felt like my stomach was going to burst from crying. My parents were sitting with me and then she said, another woman came in from the Ansar and sat with me and she saw me crying so she started crying. And then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came in and he greeted us and he sat down. And he says, Oh Aisha, the people have told me about this story. And he said that if, he said, if it is, if you have committed this, if you are innocent, then Allah will reveal your state. But if you have committed the sin, then for, ask Allah to forgive you. That's all he's saying. He's like, I don't know for certain what happened. Only Allah knows. If you did not do it, Allah will reveal the truth. And if you did, just ask Allah to forgive you. Which, if you think about it, is the only correct answer. You have to give both options. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Aisha looks at her father, Abu Bakr. And he says to Abu Bakr, she says to Abu Bakr, Dad, can you say something? Abu Bakr says, I don't know what to say. She looks at her mother, Umm Ruman, and she says, can you say something to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Like, can you, I can't, I can't even gather up the strength to speak. Can you say something? Umm Ruman says, I can't say anything. I don't know what to say. Aisha herself speaks up and she says, what an impossible position I'm in. If I tell you I didn't do it, then you will not believe me or there's always going to be this doubt. But if I tell you I did do it, I know that I didn't do anything. So who, how can I win? Does anyone, is anyone like connecting with Aisha radiallahu anha right now? In life in general? Like you feel like there's no way out of this test. You're being put in this trial and you're like, there's no way out. How am I ever going to find my way out of this test? SubhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put her through all of this. 40 days of illness, of sickness, of anxiety, of stress. Not on her 
on her family, on her spouse, on her friends, on everybody. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi at that moment, he stood. And Aisha, she says, I'm just going to say what the father of Yusuf said, Ya'qub, alayhi salam, tasabrun jameel. I'm going to be patient. Allah will defend me. I don't need anybody. All I need is Allah. What did Elias bin Abdul Salam say earlier? Allah tests you so that you arrive at a point where you say, all I need is Allah. I don't need anybody else. Just God. That's it. She said, at the moment that I said that, the Prophet ﷺ, his head lowered and he began to sweat. And his body looked like he was carrying a heavy weight, which is what the signs of wahi. When Jibreel was delivering the wahi to him, when he exited that state, he laughed and he smiled and he said, Oh Aisha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses to me that you are innocent. Allah has proclaimed your innocence. In the Quran, Surah An-Nur, Allah has proclaimed for all time that this story will be preserved and your innocence will be a lesson for everybody who's been wronged, that you were innocent. Aisha said, I was in between shock and excitement because she said, I never thought that Allah would ever mention me. I thought I was so insignificant. Why would Allah ever even care or be concerned about me that he would reveal verses about me? Now, this part's hilarious. Her mother and father, Abu Bakr and Umar Uman, they said, okay, Allah has exonerated your name. This is like amazing. And they said, go, go and thank, you know, Hug the Prophet so and thank him. She goes, not yet. I'm going to thank Allah first. I'm going to thank Allah first. Because in the moment of need, Allah was there for me. It's interesting, right? Because our human minds and hearts, we think like, why did she have to go through all of that? Like, why couldn't it have just happened in the beginning? Like maybe when she gets to the city and the rumors are starting, then the revelation comes. Okay, maybe a week, two weeks, one month of sickness. The Prophet ﷺ has to experience this. Everybody, they're all experiencing this. Why? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wait until this point? Or why did he ordain this moment was the moment that he was going to send the verse that would exonerate? It was because, as the, the commentator says, because of her statement. Her statement was what? Nobody will believe me. I have to wait for Allah to defend me. That's it. As soon as she uttered that statement, it's like Jibreel was waiting at the door. As soon as she uttered the statement of reliance upon only Allah, the revelation came and her name was cleared forever to be preserved in Surah An-Nur in the Quran. These 10 verses are not only about her, but Allah also, He basically chastises those people who spread the rumors. And some of the scholars of tafsir, they say that these 10 verses contain more anger than any of the Quran put together because of the right of Aisha was being maligned and harmed by these people. So when Aisha was sitting saying, why me? She had no idea that Allah had revealed about her these verses. But after the revelation had come, she understood the benefit of the trial and the meaning of why it was there for her. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us this understanding. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us those people that only rely upon Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala to make us those who trust in Him and that who only rely upon Him and that whenever anybody leaves us out or makes us feel isolated or cuts us off or whenever we feel like we're not being included or not being involved or not being uh, uh, in, in what we hope to be in that Allah Ta'ala is the one who takes us in. And Allah Ta'ala is the one who protects us and includes us and keeps us close to Him. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala to forgive us of our sins and to give us and our hearts insight into understanding why these trials happen and what we can do and how we can benefit. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us contentment and happiness with His decree always. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen. We have a special uh, uh, moment that I wanted to share with everybody. Bidnillah, we have our brother uh, who wanted to come and uh, actually accept, formally accept his Islam with us, uh, Brother Angel.